My name's Nick Crane, and I work for a UK company called Elucidata. We do software engineering that's rooted in data science. That means things like analytically focused software products, um, decision engines, and more generally, robust and scalable data processing solutions. I've been using R for about eight years on and off now, but I've been using it as part of my full-time job for about three years, so still kind of new to a lot of this. The project that I'm going to be talking to you about today is one that I feel genuinely privileged to be part of. Firstly, because I'm getting to see Shiny push to a point that I would have never thought possible a couple of years ago, but also because it's got a real human impact. I find as somebody that works in data, it's quite common to end up on projects where that's kind of quite far abstracted from me, where in this project, that's less so. So I'm going to start by giving you a bit of background about the project, and then I'm going to talk about the Shiny app that we built to support it, and I'm going to finish off by just going through some of the lessons we learned when we were scaling up the app. But actually, before I get started, um, can I just get a show of hands? Who here has heard of the 100,000 Genome Project? Just pop your hand up. OK, wow, so a lot more of you than I thought, actually. Um, but some of you haven't. So, oh, gosh, OK, that's um, popped up there. <laughs> Never mind. OK, so some of you haven't heard of the project. So in that case, I'm going to start by just giving you a bit of context by telling you about one of the participants in the project. OK, so this is Kate, this is Simon, and the one in the middle is their daughter, Jessica. Jessica is four years old. When she was born, um, everything seemed to be going well until Jessica was around 13 months of age. And at that point, Kate and Simon noticed that she wasn't moving around as much as other children her age. And unfortunately, she also began having seizures. So obviously, they were very worried and wanted to know what was going on. It turned out that Jessica had a condition called GLUT1 deficiency syndrome. And what that means is her brain isn't getting enough glucose or energy. Now, this is a rare disease, and it can be managed by a special diet. But the problem with that is, to manage it, you have to have the diagnosis. And in patients like this with rare diseases, it takes, on average, three incorrect diagnoses and four years to get to that final diagnosis. So obviously, that's a very stressful time during that process. And actually, patients end up on this journey that's referred to in the medical literature as a diagnostic odyssey, which means these kind of endless hospital appointments trying to figure out what is going on. And this was no diff different for Jessica. So she went for EEG scans, MRIs, lumbar punctures, and still um, doctors were no closer to having the diagnosis. Luckily, via a support network, um, Jessica's family were put in touch with the 100,000 Genome Project, and via a blood sample from each of them, Jessica and her parents had their genome sequenced and mapped, and they were able to get a diagnosis. So this is one of the uses for the 100,000 Genome Project, getting genomes mapped from patients with rare diseases and getting that diagnosis a lot quicker than otherwise would have happened. Another use for the project is um, mapping genomes um, tissue from tumour tissue um, within cancer patients to figure out what treatment they'll respond best to. So the 100,000 Genome Project was set up by the UK government with the aim of sequencing 100,000 genomes from patients with either rare diseases or cancer. And it actually met that goal last month in December 2018, and the results are still being analysed from that now. So just for a little bit of detail about the science behind it, I won't spend too long on this. Um, scientists have been able to sequence DNA since the 1970s, but in the past, it was only 5% of that information that was actually used, and 95% of it was discarded. The first full human genome was sequenced in 2003. It took over 10 years and $2 billion to get to that point, but now a full human genome can be sequenced in under a day and for less than $1,000. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, 100,000 Genome Project um, set up by the UK government to sequence 100,000 genomes with patients with rare diseases and cancer. Now, following on from this project is the rollout of the National Genomics Medicine Service. And this is the bit that's really exciting stuff. This is groundbreaking. The NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, is going to be the first public healthcare system to offer genomic testing as part of its routine healthcare. So this is like really exciting to be um, involved in this. But it's not just the actual genomic data that's important here. There's actually a massive series of steps to get from that initial blood sample to the final clinical report. The DNA is extracted, it's sent to one organisation, to another, to another, and so on. There's people with different jobs. We've got people, um, so bioinformaticians, we've got people in the lab. And it's a very complex process using data of different types. And what is needed here is some way of letting people in this process interact with this surrounding metadata, but not have to go anywhere near this level of complexity. So that's where Shiny comes in. 
So we built a shiny app um, called the MI portal or management information portal that allows people at all different stages of the data pipeline to interact with the metadata surrounding it and get their job done. Okay, so when I say this is a shiny app, this is probably the biggest shiny app I've ever worked on. And it's more like a mega app made up of a series of sub apps. Now we used more different R packages than I've got time to name, but in brief, we had a set of core packages. So things like Shiny, the Tidyverse, and packages for working with all the databases and APIs that are involved in the process. We used a lot of packages to customize look and feel, but actually probably one of the most important category of packages were HTML widgets. And actually, as a Shiny developer, HTML widgets are probably my favorite and least favorite thing in some ways, just because I can spend ages working on some really complex feature, really pushing my R skills to the limit, and chuck a HTML widget on the top of that. And when I talk to a client about it, it's always the HTML widget that they're impressed by. But joking aside, HTML widgets are a really great um, set of packages. If you've not heard of them, they basically allow you to import these kind of um, complex JavaScript libraries into your Shiny app and allow this really rich interactive functionality. So I think I've already covered most of this, but just to reiterate, the main priorities around designing this app were to create an app that could be used by people in different stages of the pro project. Each dashboard or sub app needed to answer either one question or a so small subset of questions well. Um, and another priority was to be able to iterate quickly. So as I said, this is the first time this is being done, and it's one of these projects where it really wasn't a, we weren't able to get a really clear idea of what would be needed. So this project kind of and the app around it evolved as the project went on. And that's part of the reason we use Shiny, actually. Shiny's capability for rapid prototyping made it perfect to use in this project. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through a couple of examples of people who might be using this app um, and the kind of questions they'll be asking and just show you how that would actually look in the app. So firstly, I could be a program manager at Genomics England. I might want to know how close we are to the 100,000 genomes target. So let's pretend for a bit that they've not got there yet. Um, I might want to know how many of these samples come from patients with either cancer or rare diseases. There are a lot of different metrics, actually, that can be looked at in the process. So just how do they break down by the different stages? And also, if there's any samples getting stuck in the case pipeline, where are they getting stuck? How does this vary by clinic? so then I can hopefully do something about that. OK, so we've got a version of the app here that's been loaded up with some dummy data. So I'm just going to open up the Ops uh, Management Information Dashboard. So um, we get a few high-level metrics. Um, again, we've added in some features like tooltips just to get the specific definition of that metric, because the accuracy is quite important. We've got a couple of plots there using Plotly, actually, um, HTML widget, so we can just hover over and drill down and get a little bit more information. And again, just another plot little plot just to show you the overall values. But actually, if we go into the main dashboard now, we can get much more detailed information. OK, so we've got our metrics by different stages of the process. And again, we've included just tool tips just to get a bit of extra kind of information in there. We've intentionally got some really simple plots on the right, because for more detail, we want to go into the case pipeline status. So here we've used a HTML widget called Sunburst R, which is actually really great for tracking sequences of events. So if I select a couple of clinics, OK, and I'll just give that a moment to load. And now if I start with the mouse going from the inside of the chart outwards, um, each kind of ring going out represents where in the pipeline things are. So I might keep going out to see how many samples have got to that point. And I can hover over different things to say, OK, lots of things are on hold at that point. So I might want to go and investigate that. So um, we, that, that's live and in production at the moment. And we've got good feedback on people being able to get just a really quick idea of what's going on there. So another use of the app, then, might be the sample team in the lab. So, so a very different job to the previous example. This is the person that's actually working with the DNA data themselves. So if they've got, say, a problem with the DNA sample, they need to be able to flag that up so people downstream of them know that that issue exists. They might want to know what are the other related samples in the case hierarchy. So when I say case hierarchy, when I was talking about Jessica and her mum and dad before, they're all part of the same case hierarchy. And I might just want to see if the sample has been flagged before. So has somebody else already identified this particular issue? So again, we've loaded this up with dummy data. This isn't actual data. Um, so I'll open up the processing flag tool and search for a particular case. So that goes to our database, and we get the information for the case. So again, we've got another HTML widget here called Viz Network. So we can see all the different entities within that particular case. Once I click on that, that then loads up some 
information about that so we can see the history for that particular um, that sample. We've got some metadata there about the sample, and then I can use the kind of update tool to just type in some information about what's gone wrong, and then this will send that off to our API, and then should hopefully update the flag history. So yeah, and then that's that updated that there. And we've used a few other things just around the UI. So if somebody types in something without actually specifying a reason, we just get this nice modal dialogue to help really guide the user in what they're supposed to be doing. So that's just another kind of aspect of the um, app. And that's been rolled out. That's deployed. That's live at the moment. Um, so that went successfully. So the next step, then, is to take the best bits of that app and a few other bits for the rollout of the National Genomics Medicine Service. However, the things are a little bit different this time. So as this has been rolled out across the entire country, the new version of the app needs to be able to support hundreds, if not thousands, of concurrent users. So we really needed to scale it up there. Um, now, I did originally um, intend to show you the final kind of version of the app, but as with any live project, we're not quite at that point yet. But what is more interesting and um, what I can share with you are the main things that we actually learn in the process of scaling it up. I think that would actually be much more kind of interesting to go into. OK, so firstly then, how did we scale the app? So we did partially scale the app horizontally. So the app's deployed in Docker containers, and we could just keep adding more containers and have one user per app. But we didn't want to do just that. We wanted each individual instance of the app to be able to support multiple users so we can take advantage of certain features like caching. So we needed to scale vertically as well. And to do this, part of the solution was to use the future and promises package, packages and um, make some of the app asynchronous so users wouldn't be blocking up each other's sessions. Now, in order to see which bits we needed to speed up, we made some realistic user paths and mapped those out. Obviously, the limitation here is that we've got people using the app for different things, but in our initial tests, we just decided to pick something that was quite database and API intensive and use a lot of complex shiny code just to kind of really see where our bottlenecks are likely to lie. And we used profits and shiny load tests to have a look at it. So a few things that we um, found there. There's a really great talk. I think it might be last, from last year's conference by Joe Cheng. And he talks about finding watermelons, not blueberries. In other words, find the big kind of slow bits to optimize first. So we were quite happy to see that a lot of the things that we kind of expected, um, so database calls and API calls, they were the main things that were slowing us down. Although there was a little bit we had to focus on around the shiny code first as well, which I'll come back to in a moment. We also used shiny load tests to see how the app performed with different number of people using it at the same time. And actually, one of the biggest insights we took from that, so with the graph on the left, we can see that um, creating the asynchronous version of the app kind of reduced the amount of variation. The graph on the right, it looks like there's not much difference, but actually what's happened is making the app asynchronous has reduced the outliers to um, so the really longer sessions. And actually, what we realize is it's not just about optimizing to um, reduce latency. It's also about optimizing to have really consistent experiences between different people. There's a lot of kind of stuff out there about the kind of the 99 percentile around optimization. Um, and so we realized consistency was a really important thing for us. So I'm going to finish off um, just with the key kind of lessons we learned here. So um, kind of just as Joe said before, um, I think it's really easy to get hung up on conversations around the scaling, focusing on let's make everything asynchronous. But what we actually found that was really important to try to optimize our Shiny code first. So I know that kind of as a newer Shiny developer, I did fall into the trap of certain things like filling my code with lots of complicated render UIs, and we had to kind of get rid of kind of anything that was like that. Um, there was also um, a quite common Shiny anti-pattern um, which is referred to as coding things imperatively. So it's using a lot of kind of observers and reactive values together where it's not necessarily appropriate and it's not really taking advantage of the benefits of reactive programming. So we really had to kind of make sure that our code followed that pattern and um, conformed to best practices. And that was really key to what we were doing. Another thing as well, um, as it was the database and API calls um, that were kind of the main slow things, we found it was really important to take advantage of the advanced functionality of SQL. So I think as a data scientist that doesn't do much SQL, sometimes it can be easy to fall into the trap of thinking it's all, you know, create, replace, update, delete, and joins. But actually using a bit of that wider functionality meant we were able to move more of our processing onto the database. We used a lot of database functions as well, just because we didn't want to be constructing these kind of complex database calls in R. It's, it's fine to do that, but it was just nice for us to conceptually have that separation of the different parts of the app. 
Um, and also just that writing efficient SQL is pretty important. So we worked really closely with our uh, engineering team around this side of things. A few other little bits and pieces we did. So um, we did a bit around optimizing data loading. So on some of these sub apps, um, there were certain user paths that were fairly predictable. So a user is going to load up a certain screen. They're going to look at the metrics there, and then they're going to go onto another screen. So in that case, we decided if that's pretty much what they're going to do all the time, we're going to actually load the data that they need from the database ahead of time. So then they only need to connect to the shiny session rather than you know, the session and then the database. And that helped. And finally, just going back to what I was saying before about HTML widgets, they're absolutely fantastic for interacting with data. I think that when I was creating Shiny apps earlier on in my career, there was a lot of focus maybe on click on different inputs, and then that goes back to the Shiny session. But actually, you can get a lot of the richness on what people are looking at and what people are drilling down with HTML widgets. And we found those were crucial to our design. So. Um, this has been an absolutely fantastic project to work on, and it's been really interesting just figuring out how to scale up the app. Um, I just kind of, kind of want to indulge myself with like, um, something I've noticed, actually. In a couple of years of working with Shiny um, as a consultant and a Shiny developer, it seems that it's changed a bit how Shiny's been used. So when I first started, I think I saw a lot of organizations using Shiny for these really inward-facing inward apps for sharing data within their organization. And it's really exciting to be working with Shiny at the moment where you can see all these kind of things being scaled up, making it really production capable like Joe was talking about earlier today. OK. So thank you all for coming along. And um, thanks to the rest of my team as well. Great. We have time for a couple of questions. Who's got a question? I apologize for a semi non R question. Okay. As you sure. were moving logic out into more SQL things to speed it up, how did you handle testing that within uh, the SQL infrastructure? Um, a lot of our testing is done manually, so we have a testing team, so we didn't need to automate that, so we kind of got around that issue. Other questions? I'm interested to know if, um, as you rolled it out, as you've begun to have real use, have you had any user-level performance feedback, good or bad? Um, not yet, no. We're still kind of in the process of finishing off the scaling up, but hopefully we will, and we're going to hopefully continue the development process in response to exactly what they're saying. So. Okay. And corollary to that, on the database side, do you have challenges or concerns about being sure that the infrastructure supporting the database remains responsive? Um, there's not on my side of things, but then it's more the engineering team that are dealing with that, so gotcha. I'm not sure, sorry. Gotcha, okay. Hi, Nick, thank you. Uh, how did you manage people getting back to you and telling you there's a bug here, I think there's an issue here? I mean, there's too many people working with the app. How did you manage that? Sorry, can you just repeat the question? I didn't um, I mean, how did you manage people getting back to you with the box? Like, um, I don't know how to explain it, like telling you, I think there's an issue here in this part of the code. Did they email you that? Oh, I see. So um, in terms of the actual end users then, um, that's just managed, yeah, by kind of an email process. I mean, in terms of the test team, we have kind of internal kind of software that we use to manage bugs like Jira and things like that. 